This evening uh, we're in the book of Romans, and uh, we'll be looking at verses 12 and 13. Uh, very sobering verses, very important verses that will uh, not only give us, of course, uh, the, um, well, the knowledge we need in order to grow in Christ, but will also help us to understand whether or not we're true believers, whether or not we're living according to the flesh or living by the Spirit of God. I'd like to um, back up to verse 1 and just simply read these verses in their context. So I'd like to read verses 1 through 14, but we are going to be looking at verses 12 and 13. Paul writes this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You know, I almost wanted to stop at the very beginning of, of this chapter because it can be so confusing. The word law is used in several different senses. Uh, what we need to see from this passage is Paul, after talking about the struggle between the flesh and the spirit in Romans chapter 7, goes on to tell us that if you are in Jesus Christ, you are no longer condemned because you are no longer in bondage to your flesh or to your sin because the spirit of God has set you free. He calls it the law of the spirit of life. That's the principle of the spirit. Living within you, if you are a true believer, inclining you towards what is good and right. Whereas the law of sin and death is that flesh or that corruption or that sinful nature that we had coming into the world. Now the law of God could not perfect us. It could not save us. It couldn't save us from condemnation. But what the law couldn't do, God did by sending his son, condemning sin in our flesh, giving us the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of God would work within us to make us more like Jesus. Really, the, the verses we're looking at this evening are simply the conclusion of Paul's argument where he says, if you continue to live according to the flesh, that is, if you continue to submit to sin, you're going to die. But if the Spirit of God is in you, you're going to live by the Spirit and put to death that sin. And then, of course, you will live. You will live eternally. Anyway, that's what we're going to be looking at this evening, the idea that we do have to die if we're going to live. The sin, the flesh, has to die. We have to put it to death by the Spirit of God. Remember, the topic of what we're looking at in this series is why you should do this, why you should die to sin, why you should live to God. And we started off by um, basically looking at the principle 
where all of this emanates from, why it is you should go through the difficulties of denying yourself, why you should fight against your sins, why you should lay down your life and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason is, is because if you have trusted in Jesus, when he died on the cross, you died with him. When he was buried, you were buried with him. When he was raised again to life, you were raised again to life. Basically, you died on the cross with Jesus. Your old man, your sin nature was put to death. Jesus condemned sin in the flesh, and you have been raised to life as a new creature. Now, that's the first reason why you should do this, is because in principle, it's already done. Now, of course, you need to apprehend it in your life. You need to apply it by faith. But we also saw some other reasons why you should do this, and the reason why the, the saints throughout the Bible did exactly the same thing, why they forsook the world, forsook their sins, and followed after the Lord. It's because they had faith, faith to see something which you can only see, of course, by faith, and that is the fulfillment of the promises of God. They could see the heavenly land in front of them. They could see the kingdom of God. Abraham, when he left Ur of the Chaldees went out looking for a city whose foundations and builder is God. He was looking for something better. He basically was a picture of one leaving the world in order to find that, that heavenly land which God has provided. That can only be seen by faith, faith in the promises of God. It's not just kind of hoping that something like that exists out there somewhere. God in his word has said it does exist. And if you have faith, you can see it you know it's real. You can see not only that heavenly land, but you can see the king, Jesus, in all of his glory. And as the author to the Hebrews says, you can see the spirits of angels. You can see the spirits of righteous men made perfect. You can see things that are eternal, things that will go on forever, things that are going to be there when everything else that you see now is only a distant memory. So faith enables you to see those things, to know that they're real, and of course knowing that in order to obtain them, you have to die to your sins and put on Christ, you pursue those things. You should die to sin and live to Christ because seeing these things, your heart is drawn out after them. These are the things you want. The faith that God gives you is a faith that works by love, as we've seen, that loves God, what it sees of God, what it sees of his promises fulfilled. So that love compels you forward to reach out for these things. And we also saw last week, I believe it was, that um, we're also going to pursue these things because of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, again, when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that he went through, you went through with him because he went through it for you. Even to the point of... of ascending to heaven with him. The Bible says that because we're united with Jesus Christ, we're already seated with him in the heavenly places. We are connected to him by his Holy Spirit. So in a certain sense, we are there with him. Certainly in principle, one day we're going to be there in reality. But the fact that we are united to the one who is seated in heaven creates within us a longing to be where he is. And you know when your heart desires to be somewhere, all you can think about is that place that you want to be. So if we want to be in heaven, we will think about heaven. We will set our minds on heaven and not on the things that are on the earth. Now the Bible says that that is your experience as a Christian. That's what we should all be experiencing as Christians, but we're not going to experience it perfectly, not in its fullness, no believer actually experiences these things fully, again, because of the sin that's inside of us, because of the battle that's going on in our souls that's dragging us back down to the earth, trying to bring our thoughts down to the earth, trying to bring our affections to the things of the earth, ultimately trying to destroy us. That's why the Lord continues to encourage us to move forward, to give us commands to remind us of what it is we're supposed to be doing. Again, as we saw last week, to set our mind on the things above where Christ is and not on the things that are on the earth. We have to bear in mind that if we don't want the things of heaven, we're not going to seek those things. 
If we want the things of earth, we are going to pursue those things. But again, if we love the world, the Bible says that we are not going to see heaven. And that really brings us to the motive that we're going to look at this evening. We might say the first negative motive, if we can put it that way, but certainly an important one, and that is what the Lord says will happen to you if you do not die to sin and live to God. We've talked about why it is the saints of old actually did these things, but what would happen to them if they didn't? And what will happen to us if we don't? Well, last week, again, we considered that the sin that's in your heart is working against you to try to stop you from reaching heaven. And to bring this about, it's going to tempt you in every conceivable way, try to convince you that the things that, that the Word of God says, the things that faith actually sees, are not real. It's going to try to drag your mind down to the world and tempt you to make your home here rather than there at least as long as it can, until you realize that you can't hold on to these things anymore. But if you wait till, the old, you know, till you're old and ready to die, oftentimes it's too late to do anything about it. One thing you need to realize is the sin that's inside of you has a goal. And its ultimate goal is to destroy you. And so the Bible says you have to kill it before it kills you. You have to to, by the Spirit of God, put to death the deeds of the body if you are going to live. That's what it means to die with Christ and be raised again to newness of life. So this evening, I want us to consider two things. First of all, what Paul means when he says, if you are living according to the flesh, you will die. But also, secondly, what, it, what you have to do, what you must do, if you are going to live. So first of all, what does Paul mean when he says, if you live according to the flesh, that you will die? Well, to live according to the flesh means to live according to your sinful desires. The interesting thing is, and God has his purposes for this, although we might wish it were otherwise, but when your old man was crucified, that old you on the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ, it died, it was crucified, it was done away with, but... Not entirely. Because of that, there were certain things that, well, because it was crucified, there are certain things that it can't do, that it can't do to you. It can't control you. It can't keep you bound. And it cannot make you its slave. That's the thing that Jesus Christ did away with on the cross when he broke the power of sin. But because it's still resides in you because it's still present. That corruption is still there. It can still fight against you. Sadly, it often wins the battle against you. It can take spiritual ground for you to slow down your progress and grace. Again, I remember one time, uh, one person, uh, class that I had said, you know, it's amazing how difficult it is to grow in grace. But he says, it's also amazing how quickly you can lose all that ground just in one step. You know, it can take you a long time to force yourself, as it were, to, to battle your flesh and to move ahead, but how quickly you can get back to where you were. That's the way it is. Flesh or the sin makes life difficult for you. Now, the fact is, both believers and unbelievers have this sinful principle working in their hearts. We both have them, which is why this warning exists. To live according to the flesh, which Paul tells us that if we do, we will die, is something that is the potential really for, uh, well, we might not, not, not so much for Christians, but for unbelievers. But to live according to the flesh, as I said before, means to submit to this desire, to live, as it were, according to the impulses of the heart which are contrary to God's will. To do it on a regular basis as the pattern of your life, to do it without a fight, to continually to give in, it means to live an ungodly life. Now again, both the believer and the unbeliever have this principle 
in their hearts. They both have flesh. They both have, as it were, a choice. Well, actually, the unbeliever doesn't have a choice. This is what he's going to do. But the believer does have a choice. Now, the reason why I brought this up, the reason why I say believers and unbelievers both have this principle is because Paul is giving a warning here. And he says, if this is what you are doing, if you are living according to the flesh, if you are basically giving in continually to these sinful impulses, you are going to die. Now, what kind of death is Paul speaking about here? Is he saying that you're going to die physically if you give in to the flesh? Well, actually, the Bible says we're all going to die someday. We're all going to grow old. We're all someday going to, you know, we're going to have the separation of the soul from the body. We're going to return to the dust. It's the inevitable result of the fall and sin. Now, the Bible does say when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he reverses the effects of sin on your soul. He redeems your soul, but the Bible says he hasn't yet reversed the effects of sin on the body or the fall on the body. And he's not going to do that until the resurrection when he actually makes all things new again. We will be, our bodies will be the first things that are raised. And then after judgment takes place, or at least sometime during the judgment, he's going to be bringing in the new heavens and the new earth when everything is made new again. But the fact is, he hasn't yet reversed the effect of sin on the body, the fall on the body, so that we will all die, whether we live according to the flesh or not. So this isn't what Paul's talking about. He says if you live according to the flesh, the kind of death you're going to die is the kind of death that we don't like to think about. It's, he's talking about the second death. He's talking about eternal death. He's talking about hell. The lake of fire, everlasting damnation. And what Paul says here is this, that if you are regularly or continually giving in to your sins without a battle, if you're living an ungodly life, that you will die. You will die the second death. You will end up in hell. Now, again, we're talking about motives, why you should put your sins to death. Can you think of a better motive than this? Now, I can think of one, and that is love. You know, if you love the Lord, you'll put your sins to death because you know those things are dishonoring to the Lord. But when your love fails, this will do. The desire for self-preservation will always win the day. Now, is Paul saying here, because, you know, again, I just talked about the fact that both the believer and the unbeliever have flesh, they have corruption, they have the sin in their souls, is Paul saying here that a true believer can perish, that he can end up dead in this sense? That a genuine Christian can degenerate in his Christianity and his spirituality to the point where he begins to live in sin without any kind of a battle at all? Where he lives according to the flesh? Well, no, that's not what Paul's saying because Paul knows that when Jesus gives eternal life, to a person, when he gives that life to you, that you will never perish. You will never die in this sense. You'll still die physically, as we've seen, but you will not die eternally. Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 through 29, and again, I think this is perhaps the clearest passage in Scripture, the most immediate passage in Scripture that brings this point across. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now again, the Father gave the sheep to Jesus, those who would believe on him as a reward for his work. They are his prize. They are his blessing. They are his people. Jesus says he gives eternal life to them, and he does that through his work. And he says they will never perish. They will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me either. And again, some have argued, well, maybe no one can snatch them away, but they can jump away, they can get away if they want to get away. But Jesus says, no, they won't do that either, because if they did, they could perish. But he says they will never perish. 
Now, Paul knows that this is the way it is. Paul knows this is what Jesus said. And Paul also knows from what he tells us in Romans chapter 8, if you're there, you can look in verses 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Paul knows that if God has foreknown someone, foreloved someone, that that person will eventually reach glorification. He goes on to say that there's no power in heaven and earth that can take us away from the love of God. Our eternity is secure. As I mentioned before, that's the reason why we can know that everything that happens to us is ultimately going to work together for our good because the Lord is never going to allow us to perish, but he is going to bring us to heaven, which is ultimately good. So Paul, when he says, if you live according to the flesh, you must die, can't be referring to a true believer. But what Paul is saying is that a professing believer can perish because not everybody who professes to know the Lord Jesus Christ is actually a Christian. I hope you understand that. There are many people who profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ who really don't know him at all. Now we know that the Bible says that the majority of the world is going to ultimately to perish in their sins. The way that leads to destruction is broad and many there are that go in that way. But the road that leads to life is narrow and few there are that find it. But Edwards raised a very interesting observation in his day and that is that even the majority of people, he said, who are in the visible church, <clears throat> who have heard the gospel, who have even professed to know Jesus Christ, that they are going to perish as well because in his estimation, the majority of them did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how many Christians or, you know, quote unquote Christians, people who profess Christ, really know Jesus? Sadly, you know, we do have these big mega churches with thousands of people, but how do, the, how do those churches get so many people to attend there? It's because of what they're preaching, it's because of what they're doing, it's because it's entertainment driven, it's because the whole purpose of that organization is to get people in. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't true churches that are mega churches, but they're very rare. Most of them are made up of people professing to know Jesus who really don't know him at all. I mean, how many who say that they love the Lord Jesus practice what the Lord hates? How many are there in these churches who say they've forsaken the world and that they've picked up their crosses to follow Jesus only to live for themselves and for this world? And how many try to justify the things that they're doing, saying that they are doing the will of God, when as a matter of fact, they're just doing their own will? These are the ones that Paul is warning. The ones who are going to die and end up in hell because they're really living according to their flesh and not according to the Spirit of God. Now, how do we know the difference? Again. It has to do with what they do. John tells us in his first letter, 1 John 3, 6 through 10, that those who practice sin are of the devil, they are not of God, and they ultimately are going to perish. We talked about you know, the, the verse that is perhaps the clearest way that we might know that when Jesus gives eternal life to someone, they're going to live forever. They're never going to perish. Well, here's the clearest verse in the whole Bible that talks about the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. How can you know you're a believer? How can you know you're born of God? How can you know that you are not an unbeliever of the devil? Well, John says it's quite plain. No one who abides in him, that is in Jesus, sins, that is practices sin. No one who practices sin has seen him or knows him Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin. 
because his seed abides in him. And he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. As I was reading this passage, I was reminded that you know, a number of churches, a number of these very large churches believe that just coming forward in an altar call and praying a prayer means that you are going to heaven and there's no question about it and that you cannot lose your salvation. But they also believe that you can leave, as it were, the, the front of this church having prayed this prayer and go live any way you want to live Live as a rebel against God, have no change in your life at all, and, and some would even go as far as to say is that you can even spend the rest of your life attacking the church, trying to destroy it, and you're still going to make it to heaven. Those who say that must not have read 1 John, because 1 John tells us that those who do these things are the children of the devil. They are not the children of God. The children of God are those who actually do what the Lord calls them to do, the ones who actually are putting their sins to death and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. So how many Christians really know Jesus? Well, no one who lives according to the flesh knows Jesus. Those who live according to the flesh, according to their sinful desires, those who basically go with their sinful hearts, you know, the idea of following your heart, ultimately that's what it means if you're an unbeliever, is do what you feel like doing, right? But what you feel like doing if you're an unbeliever is sin. If you do that, you're living according to the flesh. And if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. Why should you put your sins to death? Because if you live according to your sins, if you give in to them, you're going to end up in hell. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to break the power of sin. He came to set you free from these things. And that it really brings us to the second point. If living according to the flesh means that you are going to end up in hell, what do you have to do to live? Well, you know, as I've been reading these passages, I, I think you understand that the believer is distinguished from the unbeliever by the fact that he obeys, that he practices righteousness. And how is he able to do this? Well, it's the work of Jesus Christ in him. Jesus came to break the power of sin. And how does he do that? Except by the Spirit. The Spirit, as we saw in, in uh, Romans chapter 1, is the one who alone can give you the power to kill the flesh, to put your sins to death, and to obey the Lord. Paul began this chapter by pointing out that those who are not under condemnation are those who walk by the Spirit of God. The law or the principle of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. If you're a true believer, you have the Spirit of God and he has broken the power of sin within you you are no longer a rebel against God. You no longer practice sin. You are free. And because of that, you will not be condemned along with the world because you no longer practice sin. But now you walk by the Spirit. Now you do what the Spirit of God is, is calling you to do. You know, Paul also, again, even though these things are a reality in our lives, it doesn't mean that the Scripture isn't going to command us to do the same thing. You know, there's the idea of, um, uh, this, this is the way it was put in seminary, the idea, they call it the indicative and then the imperative. The indicative is, is this is what's true of you. The Spirit of God lives in you, and He's broken the power of sin, and you want to do what's right. And on the basis of that comes the imperative or the command. Therefore, live this way. Now, how could you obey a command like this one unless it was already true that the Spirit of God was in you? Paul says in Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. How can you walk by the Spirit unless God's already given you His Spirit? But that's exactly what He has done. He gives you His Spirit and then He says, live 
by that Spirit. Live by the power of the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So to overcome your flesh so that you don't live according to the flesh, so that you don't die, you must walk by the Spirit. And what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Well, it's very similar to what it means to walk according to the flesh, only it's, you know, the Spirit leads you in a different direction. To live according to the flesh means to yield to your ungodly desires, your sinful desires, and to do those things. But to walk by the Spirit means to yield to the righteous desires that the Spirit of God works in you because He is, in fact, in your soul. I was just having this conversation earlier today. We were talking about the fact that, um, you know, we, we have these desires within us as a Christian. As a Christian, you have two desires. Unbelievers only have one. They just have the corruption in the flesh. They have just the desire to do what is contrary to God's will. But the believer has two desires. He has the sinful impulses of the flesh. That's why Paul actually gives this warning here. But he also has the righteous desire of the Holy Spirit. And these two things that are in you are not choices, basically. I mean, you, you don't choose to have these things in you. They are two different natures, the old nature and the new nature, the old man and the new man. Basically, they're two different inclinations that you have. One of them is the result of Adam's sin in the garden. The reason why you have the inclination toward evil is because Adam sinned. When he sinned, he brought guilt on himself and the whole human race. And with that guilt came the absence of the Holy Spirit and the presence of these evil inclinations or desires. So we have that by virtue of being in the human race because of Adam's sin. But you also have another inclination, another desire, because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you didn't choose to have these two natures. One was given to you by birth. The other was given to you by the new birth. But you do have a choice as to which one you're going to obey, you see, which one you're going to submit to. If you are a believer, though you will from time to time, submit to your flesh and make sinful choices, John tells us that you will not do that as a pattern of life. You will cross the desire of your flesh. You will fight against it. You will choose as a pattern of life to do the right thing. You will choose the direction the Spirit is inclining you. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit of God. You will forsake your sin and obey the Lord. You will forsake this world and seek God's kingdom. You will have your mind set on the things above and not on the things below. You will not live for yourselves, but you will live for him. By the way, that's how you can know that you're a Christian. This is how you can have assurance. Your assurance should not come from a prayer that you prayed. Your assurance should come from how you're living. You see, if you're putting your sins to death, you, you know that's only possible by having the Spirit of God in you. That's how you know that you have the Spirit of God. And you know that if you have the Spirit of God, you know you're going to live. Not just in this world, but to, you're going to inherit eternal life. Because those who practice righteousness will inherit the kingdom of God. That's how you can have assurance. So again, Paul's point is, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How can you put the, the, the deeds of the body to death? How can you live? Only by the Spirit of God. If God has given you his Spirit, then you have everything that you need. Because the power of sin has been broken in your life. You no longer want exclusively to sin. The, this new principle makes you want to deny your sin and to live according to righteousness, to do the will of God. This is the only difference between a believer and an unbeliever is the presence of the Holy Spirit and that inclination toward righteousness. If you have it, you have everything you need to put to death the deeds of the body and live. If you don't have it, 
And you can know that you don't have it by the fact that you practice sin. And by the way, practicing sin does not mean falling into a sin over and over again. The Bible says that we actually have that potential as Christians to sin over and over, that we have besetting sins that we are constantly fighting against. The key is the fight, the battle. You're actually fighting against them. You're wanting to put them off. You're wanting to overcome them. And you hate the fact that you fall into them. You hate the fact that you want to do these things. You would be free of them if you could. I've used this illustration several times, but if there was a switch on your body somewhere that you could just throw the off switch and the sin was gone, if you're a believer, you would switch it off. If you were an unbeliever, you couldn't do it because you love your sins too much. So if you don't have the Spirit of God, you, and you know that by the fact that you practice sin, you have to receive Him first before you can live. The only way you can receive the Spirit of God is if the Lord gives Him to you. And the only way He will give Him to you, well, not the only way, but generally the way He does it is you ask you have to pray and ask him to break that sin in your heart. And pray until the Lord does do that for you. And you will know when you have the Spirit of God, when you can turn from your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and begin to live the kind of life he calls you to live. The only way you can do that is by the Spirit of God. If you have the Spirit of God, that's what you're doing, and that's how you can know you have him. But one other thing that this reminds us of is this. If you have the Spirit of God, it is true that you have everything that you need, but it doesn't work automatically. The Spirit of God, we don't have His, His fullness. You know, the Lord has given to us so much of the Spirit to, in, to sort of incline us in a particular direction. But you need to do certain things to strengthen the work of the Spirit of God in you. You should never be content with your current spiritual state. But labor to strengthen his influence so that you can kind of accelerate, as it were, this process of sanctification. Being filled with the Spirit of God is what you need, and that's something that God actually commands you to do through the Apostle Paul. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, don't be under the influence of things. Don't let your heart go out this way or that way to the things of the world, especially things that have the power to control you. Don't give your heart over to those things, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with a love for God. Now, to do this, you know that you need to use the means of grace. You do need to spend time in prayer. You need to spend time in the Word. You need to spend time in worship. You need to hear the Word of God preached. This is a means of grace. I hope it's uh, you know, provoking something in you to desire to go the right way, even if it is by way of a, of a warning. You know, if you give in to your flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit of God you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. You have to use these means. There's no other way. You can't just go through life without praying, without reading the Word of God, without worshiping the Lord, keeping away from church, from the worship service, I mean, and from fellowship, and expect to be spiritually strong. You can't. It's not going to happen. And you can't expect even using the means of grace to continually give in to sin and quench and grieve the Spirit and expect to make spiritual ground. You can't. It's not going to happen. You have to use the means and you have to deny your flesh. You have to put to death the deeds of the flesh and you have to, by the Spirit, well, put them to death and walk in the Spirit or go the direction the Spirit of God is calling you to go. So you need to gain as much as you can of the Spirit's influence and at the same time protect what you have. Again, I've mentioned this several times, but I suspect that we tend to forget from week to week what we need to do, so we need to be encouraged to do this again. So be encouraged by all the things we've seen so far to set your hearts on doing these particular things. This is the, the narrow path that leads to heaven. This is, again, what we're looking at in Pilgrim's Progress is the narrow road that leads to, to you know, heavenly Mount Zion for praise. This is the narrow road that leads to life. Walking in the commandments of God, walking by the Spirit, which we can only do if we deny the flesh, if we put to death the deeds of the flesh. 
We have got to do it. If we're not doing that, we're going to die. If we do it, we will live. The Bible says every Christian is going to do this. God has given you a spirit, if you're a believer, and he's given you the command, and so now there's no excuse not to do it. We have all these reasons, we have all of these uh, motives. We need to seek after the Lord. Well, may the Lord give us the grace actually to do this. This is the key, so to speak, of being a mature Christian. This is how you grow. This is how you become more like Jesus. This is how you, you become more useful. This is what you need to do in order to, when you've lived your life, to be able to look back and say, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. Now there's laid up for me in heaven the crown of life. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not just a prayer that brings you there, but it is a lifelong struggle against the flesh and a yielding to the Spirit of God. May the Lord give us the grace then to do that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us take what we've heard, and obviously we can't apply everything we've heard tonight in one shot, but let's just simply pray that the Lord would help us to understand these principles and begin to apply them throughout life, from now to the end of our lives. Okay, let, let's spend a few moments then in prayer.